congratulations. I think this is a fascinating movie. Um, oh. Where did you get the idea to do a conversation between uh, Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams? Well, you know, it actually happened. It's, you know, it's like these kind of wonderful mistakes that happen sometimes when, you know, I had been wanting to make a film on, on Truman and I really wanted to be focused on his words. And I really, um, and what happened is that another film was being made at the same time and I knew it was going to be made faster. And so my producer, Mark Lee, suggested that I put Tennessee Williams. I add him in and all of a sudden this incredible story just popped out and I had already done all of the Truman Capote research and so doing the Tennessee all of a sudden I saw all of these different you know so because we know not only are they same you know but they're southern writers they both start to write at a very young age they both had very difficult childhoods they both are children of alcoholics they're both gay um, and so there was, and then I also had this great expat life that is so important to me. This, I always like to have my films going to Europe in some way because that's part of my life. Um, and and I, the premise of using their words to create a film and a story was always there. But what it allowed us to do was to create a story that was based on that we had the freedom to edit and go in any direction we want because it was no way ever going to be a biopic, but it's almost created this kind of feeling that we're just eavesdropping in on this conversation between these two great literary minds. And, um, and I, I hope that's what really came out of it ultimately. Well, you know, you could have taken it many different ways, but you chose yeah. to, to take it this way. So um, please talk about that. You know, I think that it, it was important, I guess, in, in the films that I've been making, you know, I, I'm clearly stuck in the 20th century. I mean, there's so many great people and characters from the 20th century. And, and I, I do feel like I have the good fortune to be able to redefine them for our generation and then really introduce them to a younger generation. I have a 19 year old and, you know, there, there's not that much focus on these things anymore or these people. And, um, and I think that what's happened to both the legacy of Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams that it has been kind of lost in the end of their lives and the fact that they were, uh, you know, physically, you know, they were, they were alcoholics, you know, the way that they were out there was, people don't remember their words. And for me, it was, we have to remember that they were writers. They were these incredibly talented writers. And, um, and that's what I really wanted to show and it just and it just was such a joy to be able to use their because you know all of the material is culled from obviously biographies that have been written from archives from letters it's you know it's just kind of culled from all these different places and then to be able to merge it it was so much fun to be able to have the kind of freedom to say you know to to, to go from one topic to the next but of course we had the good fortune that we had some wonderful archival interviews because David Frost was, you know, I've, I'm sure you're very familiar with, I've, I've never worked with David Frost interviews before. And these were just such a surprise for me. And um, a surprise because of the depth of these, the interviews, because that's not what we see today. And, um, but there was something about the intimacy and the way that he just, you know, like kind of went in on them and not only physically went in on them and touched them and leaned in toward them as he was talking, but he was just asking very profound questions. And, um, and, and also Dick, Dick Cabot did the same thing, but it was really, we used those interviews as a launching pad to kind of go off and say, oh, well, let's just kind of go there and go there. And uh, so it was really nice to be able to do that. Now you also, uh, you have the, these archival interviews and then you also have these two wonderful voices, these two actors. Um, how did you uh, pick um, Zach and, 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 and Jim and, uh, and why? Well, it's kind of a dream team to be, honestly. <laughs> you, you always have the top of your list, you have names and you know, I always look at it I kind of function this way, it's plan A, plan B, plan C, and hopefully you don't have to go farther down. And they were my plan A. And, you know, I, and I, I unfortunately, I do feel that COVID helped us in this time because, you know, we were at a, we were at actually a narrative lock at that point and we were able to really, uh, and so you know, people were blocked. And I think that this came up at a time that they also had the freedom to, to think about a project like this. And, you know, and I felt that 
I know I knew for a fact that Zach had acted in Tennessee Williams plays and he was a huge, just adored Williams. And he really helped because he's good friends with Jim Parsons. He helped me get Jim. And, um, and he was just like, they've both been so supportive of this whole process. And, and I think it's like, this is such a, it's been such an introspective time for everybody. And, um, and the fact that everybody had some time to think about it, to use it, and to think about the words, because, you know, we didn't want them to sound like Truman and Tennessee, but it, we wanted to have the emotions come through the words. And I th they did such a beautiful job, both of them doing that. I, I was going to say, it's so easy to, to, to make a caricature out of, out of Truman. Uh, and, he, he, and he didn't do it. And um, how involved was the, was it, was the, were you there for the recording? Did you, did you direct them? We did. I mean, we were lucky. We were in COVID studios. And so it was like all kind of protocol approved studios. Yes, I was with both of them. I flew out to LA because Zach was in LA at the time. And then I just went upstate um, for Jim. And, you know, I was there. And I think that, you know, it's, it's an instinctual thing on both, on both of our part when we knew that each, each one had the right line, the right sentiment in it. And, um, and it was, and they both worked really, really hard at it. But I think that they were so inspired by the lines and, and, you know, the fact that also Truman and Tennessee were gay, were both gay writers, openly gay at a time. And they talked about it. Tennessee wrote about it. I mean, it was just very, very brave. And it was important to also have the actors who were, playing them to be that way and also to be embrace it and to be open and supportive. And so it was, it, it was absolutely perfect. So I felt, I feel very, very lucky that they joined on the project and they completely elevated it. I mean, it's just absolute chance. Um, can we talk about your visual style? Um, we can. <laughs> uh, tell us how you visual, your, your visual uh, strategy. Sure. You know what? I, it was very clear to me how uh, I wanted us to shoot the film. And, you know, first of all, I work with a very talented DP by the name of Shane Ziegler, who I, he shot also Love Cecil, and he, we work on a lot of projects together. And um, from the very beginning of the project, I knew that I did not want talking heads. And so you don't have talking heads, but, you know, you need to fill up all this time with something. And um, I, there were a lot of different visual assets, you know, because I, I, if you're familiar with my work, you know that I love archives, I love photography. And, um, and so I, there were a lot of different photographs that I found. There was a wonderful archive of um, a photographer by the name of David Atty, who worked with the art director, uh, Brodovich. And there are all those kind of wonderful distorted images within um, the film. And you know, I think we have 28 of them that have never been seen before. And the footage, we shot a lot with Bolex. And you know, we went to Ischia, the, um, where Truman and Tennessee had worked together. And we had just the best time walking around. It was Shane, Mark, the three of us, and we had a, a location scout from the, my brilliant friend. And you know, we just wanted to get beautiful things and just to kind of kept, capture a flavor of something. And I always knew that I wanted it to be with these layers and just kind of everything moving, the words are moving, we're moving, we're thinking of things. And, and I'm sure that people are gonna find it also confusing sometimes, but I wanted to be kind of in this dreamscape and, um, um, and then have kind of this archival footage coming out of this, this dreamscape. And, um, you know, I think it worked. I mean, I'm not sure it would work with all subject matters, but I think it worked with them. And, um, and, you know, we also, the music was an important component and I worked with an Italian composer who, you know, was, we worked so closely during, you know, he's, he's based out of Brindisi in Italy. And, um, and we just worked very, very closely um, going through the words and, and I, I love the score of the film. You know, it's, 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 it's actually really sad how the, these two wonderful writers um, succumb to alcohol and 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 oh. addiction, and we're we're felled by it. Um, do you think Truman turned into a real Warhol icon? Do you think if 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 Tennessee Williams had had 
lived, do you think he would have joined, he would have been part of Warhol's uh, pantheon, do you think? Or was yeah. It's a good, it's actually a good question because I, I, I don't think, I don't think so because he was much more, Capote really thrived on the attention from other people. And, um, and he, uh, that was just part of, part of him. I mean, and, but he, it was so odd because he also destroyed it by when he, you know, when he wrote it, um, answered prayers. And I think that you know, Tennessee really did not love the limelight like that. You know, for him, it was of course important to hear what the critics said about his work, but Tennessee was this real creative force. And let's remember that even during his, when he was really an addict toward the end of his life, I mean, he really was always an addict, but that he was really suffering from that. He was still writing every day. It's very unclear that Truman was right. And, um, and, you know, there was also something about completely creating, Truman really created himself from a very young age. There's something very authentic about Tennessee. There's something, you know, his, his journals talk about his, he's always talking about his true feelings. You never get the sense that of Truman's real feelings about things. He said things, but it was almost like he said it almost in a reactionary fashion. And, um, and you know, and ultimately, you know, the, it's fame did drive them in down a path of solitude and destruction also. Um, so, but I do, I really don't think, and there are probably lots of Tennessee uh, Williams expert who would uh, not agree with me, but maybe not. I mean, I just, he, he didn't crave the limelight like Truman did. What, what is their place in, in, in American culture today? As you said earlier to the 19 year old, who, why do we care about Truman and Tennessee? What is their place? Well, I think in with Tennessee Williams, it's very, very clear that his words, what he talked about, what he brought on stage has become really the vernacular of American theater, but of a lot of things, because he really made it our right to be able to talk about your inner feelings about sexuality. I mean, look at all the times he was censored, you know, all, all these different plays were censored. And, and I think with, uh, you know, Truman Capote, he really has, I think there's, even today, there's so many girls who think about Breakfast at Tiffany's and, you know, they think of that girl. They think of Audrey, although don't forget, it was really supposed to be Marilyn Monroe. And, um, and I think, you know, their words, Truman was a beautiful storyteller, absolutely beautiful storyteller. I mean, you know, he, uh, you know, it's, I think it's their words really are the, what are, they've given this richness to American culture and, you know, they're never really going to disappear. And, they're part of the literary imprint of America, the 20th century, there's no doubt. And, and I just hope that you know, we, through the film, try to really, really humanize them. And we really wanted to highlight their talent as writers. And yes, they did go down this destructive path of addiction. And, and I ha I'm happy that you mentioned it because you know, during, those, during that time, they didn't talk about addiction in that way. And today, it's, it's much more, people are much more open about it. And there are resources to be able to handle it and go through it. But that was, it was important for us not to shy away from that at all, because they were children of, of alcoholics. And it just, you know, completely encompassed their life as well. Um, Lisa, let's a little speculation. If they were our contemporaries, if they were living today, um, how, uh, how well- You're asking a hard question, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> how well would they meld with, our, with, with the zeitgeist that we're, we're in now? Truman would probably have a much better time with it. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I think with the zeitgeist of today, well, I think he, he would actually, he would definitely say a lot of wrong things. I think that Truman would be hushed many times. Okay, in this whole Me Too generation, because he'll definitely say a lot of the, of the incorrect things. And uh, because look at answer, I mean, I go back to answer prayers, and he, you know, he just destroyed all of his friends in New York. And, uh, and, you know, I think that there's just something very human and caring about Tennessee. And, you know, I, and I just, I just can't help to think about his journals because he was so transparent in all of them. He was transparent about his, you know, having the mean, the mean views and, uh, 
you know, being depressed and being, uh, but, you know, he was, he was talking about all of these things. He was, you know, he brought so many things in his, he discussed all these details of his inner self in his work. And I think that it's really, really important. And frankly, I think he would have done much better today in this kind of moment of transparency, just because there was, he was so much more honest with himself about his own desires, his own shortcomings. Truman had this kind of veneer around him that, of not being truthful. And, you know, it was, it was hard for me. I had already done my Truman research and then I was go into Tennessee and I felt hard for Tennessee Williams, big time. I really did. And, um, and his, I just, because he, there was something about him. And, and, and for me, it's this, the authenticity of his words that really hit me hard and that meant a lot to me. Um, and so I, and I, I do think that I mean, we were very careful not to show favoritism to Tennessee. I don't think we did. I hope not. 